Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining us for another one of our Siemens Cinemark webinars. Today's content uh, should be pretty interesting. It's our first chance to start to look at what we call mixed technology. So in this scenario, this is going to be a base turning machine, a base lathe, um, but it's going to have C-axis and Y-axis capabilities. Uh, we are going to use Shop Turn, our conversational interface, to be able to program and utilize this. Um, in the not too distant future, we'll do an equivalent seminar uh, specific to the G-code side as well. Okay, so I am your presenter, Chris Pollock. I'm a uh, dealer support specialist for Siemens in the uh, Northeast. I'm based out of New York. I am here as a uh, support line for any of you guys that uh, needs to dig into some operation and programming based topics from our control perspective. And I do get into a little bit of the technical stuff as well. So if you ever need me, feel free to reach out. Um, phone or email, I would say probably email is the easiest. I do travel a fair amount, but uh, I am here as a resource as always. So coming up, just to give you guys a little uh, little teaser of what you have coming up for some uh, new seminars, some new webinar content. Uh, the next one we're going to do is going to be going back to do some five axis. We've done some five axis in the past, uh, but this will be G code specific. So not just in shop mill, we're going to specifically look at methodizing three plus two parts from the G code side of our control. That's uh, a program guide. After that, we're going to switch gears a little bit and actually look at four axis milling in the shop mill or the conversational side of the world. And uh, in September, we're going to do a webinar on our new DXF, uh, our DXF uh, reader um, as well. It allows us to do some programming right at the control right off of DXFs. Um, and we will show you kind of a little snippet of that, that in today's section at the very end, uh, just as a, uh, a little bit of a teaser for what's coming up. Okay. so. Uh, just to make sure those of us that maybe haven't, uh, haven't seen one of these webinars before, uh, maybe you were referred to by a friend or a colleague and you don't know where to drive to get to the content. So our main landing page here in the U.S. for all themes, things, Siemens, uh, Cinemaric from the operation and programming perspective is our website CNC for you. So the web address is right here at the top of the screen, the usa.siemens.com forward slash CNC for you. Uh, please feel free to check it out. There's all kinds of great content you can find here. But additionally, all of our webinars are um, not only promoted here for registering for the next upcoming one, uh, but you can get access to all of the previously held ones and view the recordings. So if you click the webinar link, once you go in, it'll be broken down, milling, turning, some general operation content, and some maintenance and service. Go into there and you're going to see lists and lists of all sorts of webinars there that you guys can go back to and read and refer your colleagues to. Now additionally, if you go to the training section or you use the shortcut on the top of the screen that goes right to the CNC training section, we also do have in-person training that we host at our training facility that's out in Chicago, Illinois. So if you guys are interested in checking some of that stuff out, it's a great opportunity to get some real good hands-on experience from an operation and programming scenario. We have three different levels of classes. Level one is conversational, so it talks about shop mill and shop turn in the same class. Level two goes into G-code programming with program guide, and that would be both milling and turning. And level three is the five-axis class we host, which I personally am the instructor for. And uh, that one gets digs into five axis from not only three plus two, but full five axis simultaneous. We have machines in a lab. We get to run parts. So it's a great program. If you have the time, please feel free to come out and join us. And it is a, uh, it's a free program. There's no charge to attend these courses. So you can register right from the site if you see one. There's also a link for the agenda that will tell you a little bit about the course. Okay. So what we're looking at today is specific and will or is is functionally specific to both the 828 and the 840 control so anything we cover today as long as your machine is obviously equipped with that technology could be applied in either of the two variants both the 828 and the 840. 
So just the basic overview here, this is our first opportunity to kind of dig into the world of mixed technology. So what do we mean when we say the term mixed technology? So basically, any scenario where we're combining two different types of machine tool operations into one. So when, uh, when we say that, we mean, you know, it's a, it's a lathe, but has milling capabilities. So we're mixing those two technologies together. Uh, or it's a mill that has turning capabilities. You know, that's a, that's a big part of the marketplace these days. But this goes on beyond just milling and turning. You know, what happens if it's a mill that can do grinding um, or a lathe that has additive capabilities. So any time you're mixing these two different technologies together, we're always going to refer to it as mixed technology. So in this case, this is fundamentally a lathe that was built with the capability of positioning its spindle and doing, um, doing interpolation with its spindle. So it has a C-axis, um, C-axis slave spindle, as well as this machine will also have a Y-axis. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And we're going to do a, a, a few of the common operations you see in this type of scenario. So first thing we want to kind of talk about a little bit is just getting used to what the display is going to look like, um, what's going to be kind of different from coming from maybe a traditional lathe control or lathe application to a mixed technology lathe. So the base technology is still built as a lathe. So the graphics, the screens are going to look extremely similar. Really what you're going to have is just a new, few new features. So for argument's sake, in the, you know, for the axis position window or our, co our coordinate display, you're going to see a few new axes. So in this case, this machine was built with a Y axis as well as a positional spindle. So now we get a third linear axis showing up. Now the machine from an X perspective is still, can be still driven in diametric mode. It's still a base lathe. Um, and then you'll find you sometimes will switch between diametric mode and a linear mode in X, depending on how you're applying the technology. Now, if it was just a simple C-axis lathe without Y, the Y would just be missing. It would just say X and Z, but then still show you your spindle displays. Now, from the spindle perspective, uh, the one we happen to be using is actually a little more advanced because not only does it have a C-axis or a live main spindle, but it also has live tooling. In addition, this machine is actually equipped with a counter or secondary spindle, or also referred to as a sub-spindle. And with a sub-spindle, you have an additional linear and then obviously positionable spindle axis. So that would be the Z2 that we see here over in the list and the SP2. So the terminology, when you start to talk about these types of machines, when we refer to the spindles, it will change from builder to builder. Um, this is a pretty common scenario. Um, usually in the basic machines that only have a single positionable spindle, so just one main spindle, uh, sometimes you, a lot of times you'll see that referred to as the C. Once you find you get into machines that have a lot of spindles, so in this case this one has three, then it's more common to see the, the OEM referred to them as spindle one, spindle two, spindle three. So in this variation, spindle one is my main spindle, spindle two is my sub spindle, Spindle three is my live tooling, and the spindle three is the only one of the three that's not positionable, per se, because it's just a milling-style spindle. So you will get the additional display for our positioning, because it's important for us now to know where those spindles are physically positioning to. So this just kind of gives you an overview, um, just to kind of get your head around what the, the kinematic setup looks like. So this would be a very traditional main spindle, sub spindle kind of configuration. So we have a main spindle on the left. In this case, we're designating just C1 um, or SP1, however you like to look at it terminology. But this would be the main spindle. From there, we happen to have a sub spindle that can move back and forth. And that was that Z2 axis or that additional Z axis. And this would be the sub spindle. And then you have your turret. And the turret is what's going to physically possess not only the X and Z axis like we're used to in a lathe, but there's also going to be a Y axis here. And the Y axis will certainly move um, perpendicular to the other axes. Now the Y axis tends to be a little on the limited side as far as travel range. So you're going to find as we go through some features, I may choose to use the C axis or the Y axis. And a lot of times that'll depend on whether I have enough just travel in the Y axis. Uh, they tend to, do tend to be a little bit more on the limited side. So from a, a setup standpoint, from a builder, what generally happens in this type of technology is 
we want to have a fixed datum where, where everything works from. So the machine zero, instead of being positioned in some random location in the machine's travel, is generally datum to the center line of the main spindle and the front of the main spindle. This allows all offsets to build from that known point. So whether it's just knowing where the workpiece coordinate zero is going to be, we can actually start to compensate for how all of the components stack off of this position. So chuck size, jaw projection, blank size. The system can compensate for all these values. Additionally, a lot of times when you look at turrets in this technology, they have quick change holders. There's a quick little example of a VDI holder. Um, but there's all, also all sorts of numbers of different configurations of tools. So what will happen is the spindle face is actually going to be datumed to this to the to the physical turret face. So if I was to move the turret without a tool all the way over and touch the face of the spindle, I would be reading a position of zero. And then as I move the turret away, then I'm going to see positive motion moving away. And then all of my tooling would then be banked off of the spindle. As well, the subspindle is commissioned the same way. So the face of the subspindle would be zero in relation to the face of the main spindle. So if I move the subspindle all the way up and touch the two together and I looked at my display without any offset set, I should expect to see a value of zero. As I move the subspindle to the right, I should start to see a positive value shifting. So this hopefully guys starts to kind of get your head around how most builders would start to set up and commission these types of machines. It's important because you got a, you got a lot of things going on when you get to this type of technology, and it just gets more complicated, certainly, from here. Okay, so on top of just the coordinates display changing and some new axes, we also had to get some additional functionality within the screens, like our TSM window or our tier FS, to now handle multiple spindles. So if I want to fire up my main spindle or fire up my secondary or live tool, you now get a little toggle field under the TSM window, and I can choose which of the spindles I want to run. The rest of inputting the information is going to be the same as we always did. So I'm going to type in a spindle RPM, give it a direction, but now whichever spindle I selected, that's the spindle that's going to fire up. Um, and certainly once I've turned on one spindle, if I need to go turn on a second for argument's sake and leave the first running, you just come back to this screen, pick the next spindle, give it an RPM, give it a direction, and it'll fire up. Additionally, from the delay display perspective, we don't have the room or the real estate here to show you all the spindles at the same time as far as from a running standpoint. So now you get the ability of toggling between these spindles, and that's this little pull down. Now, just to get your head kind of around what the, the, com the configuration of the machine we're going to be using for our examples looks like, it would be a traditional slant bed configuration. So the turret would be up in the back section as we see here in this little image. We have a fixed spindle on the left and then a movable subspindle on the right. Great. So what gets new from the tooling and the setup side? Well, now you're going to start to be able to utilize um, a lot of the, the milling tools and the additional tools that you traditionally wouldn't be able to use if it was just a basic lathe configuration. So when I start to build some new tools, I'm now going to see a whole host of new cutter configurations that are now available to me. So maybe it's something as simple as end mill. I have to come in and pick the end mill. Now what's new now is the fact that I can now choose different orientations of this milling tool. You know, do I want to do a face milling operation? So that's what we usually would refer to as an axial tool, right? It's pointing to the face. Maybe I want to do a milling feature on the outside diameter of a part. So that's usually what we call a peripheral orientation, and that would be the second tool over in my orientation. So that would be for OD milling of a feature. The other direction of axial tool would be, hey, I want to take a milling tool, but I want to go cut something on my subspindle. So I would choose the secondary orientation. And the, certainly the fourth orientation would be if I had a special type of tool that allows me to reach inside of a part. Um, I could then use that to do ID milling for features or operations. So you got all of the tools that you may be aware of or familiar with from the milling side of the control, if you've been running the, the control in a milling variant. Well, they're all here, even though this is actually inherently a lathe. Additionally, from the drill side, it's the same scenario. So now I can choose 
drills in an axial orientations, peripheral drills. Um, I have a whole host of other drilling tools that we can choose from, taps, reams, whatever I have to be using. And then from there, we're going to then apply it to the technology. Now, there is no differentiator as to whether or not this tool is static. Static would be traditionally a tool that's non-motorized, right? So that could be sitting in the turret or sitting in a tailstock or something. And a tool that's motorized or has a live spindle to it. So you'll choose the same tool. So it's up to you when you go to apply the tool in a cycle to know that, hey, this is going to be a physical live tool, and I physically bolted that tool to the live tool station of that turret. So from a tool definition standpoint, it's going to be either static or live. It's the same orientation. Now, when you build the tool, you do define a direction. The direction may change based on where the motor is, right? Because if you look at it, the spindle is pointing a different direction. So don't be surprised. It depends on how the builder sets up the machine tool. But you may actually find that you have to actually switch the spindle direction to what you're used to because now it's a live tool. And there's nothing here that necessarily denotes that it's a live tool. So you've created a tool. Now, obviously, the setup is going to be a little different than I'm used to in the standard measure tool. So now you'll see the graphics will automatically support and show you either an axial orientation and then be asking for you to set up that tool in that orientation or in a peripheral orientation. Then I'm going to go through the process steps of touching the tool. Now, this would be a representation, certainly, of manually setting a tool. Um, if you happen to have a presetter, which a lot of machine tools in this, when you get to this type of technology usually do, then you'd use the automatic and they would just come down and physically touch the presetter like you'd be used to if you're doing it for just a standard turning tool. Now, once you've set up the tool, we certainly have to deal with some additional features at the work coordinate level or the offset level. So one of the big things you're going to start to see and use for potential setup is not only do you have the X and Z, shifting of the work coordinate system, but now you have a Y field. So the Y, kind of just like the X, that would usually shift the tool off center line. So typically the machine set up, so the Y axis zero is dead center with the spindle. So you usually don't find yourself offsetting the Y unless for some reason you have, you have an issue where you would physically have to shift things up off center line of a feature or of a part. You as well can then give it a positional or an angular offset right in the C or SP field, and that would be clocking or orienting the positionable spindle of the machine. Now, when you find yourself running on machines that have subspindles, you're also going to get a, a secondary Z2, so now you can set work coordinates here. Uh, we will do, in the not-so-distant future, a webinar getting into actually using a subspindle to see in a lot more detail, and then we'll go into all the tricks of how to actually set up a physical subspindle. But for right now, I just want to get you familiar with some of the new fields that you're going to start to see when you get to this mixed technology variation. So let's transition over to CineTrain and just take a quick look at some of these features live. So when I come over to CineTrain, I have a basic machine that we've generated. And here you just start to see now your new axis displays, as I mentioned. We can scroll down. We can see all of the additional axes here. Most builders will set up a larger font for the primary linear axes. So that's what catches your eye. And then you use a smaller font for real estate sake for the other axes. Now, from the spindle running side, you can now toggle a display and change which spindle I'm viewing as far as its motion. So let's say I wanted to turn on my subspindle at some RPM. Well, we can use our TSM screen, as we always do. And I can come down and select spindle 2, which is my subspindle. And now I'm going to give it whatever RPM I want and a spindle direction when we fire the machine up. So, as long as my display is viewing S2, I'm going to see what's happening with my override and that spindle. But you can, again, toggle the display. So if I'm viewing spindle 1, it doesn't mean that spindle 2 is not running. If I jump back to it, you'll still see the RPM. It's just, this is just a way to be able to view. Them. Now, if you have a machine with a touchscreen, you can just click on these fields. But if you don't, you're going to use the Next Window button to move around your cursor. So once you select the Next Window button, you can hit the Select key. And then you can move up or down, pick the desired spindle you want to view, 
and now you're looking at it. But you also notice when I drove the spindle, it automatically updated that field because we're assuming, hey, if you're going to fire up spindle 2, you're probably going to want to view spindle 2. And then I can have multiples running at the same time. So these are the new features from the jog perspective. Um, certainly, when you get to looking at tools from the offset like we were looking at, um, I created or pre-created a bunch of tools for time's sake that we're going to use in our program. But let's say for argument's sake, I was going to create a tool. Now you're going to select new tool. You still have your favorites. And now you have all your milling tools, milling, drilling. So you notice when you get to milling and drilling tools, there's only four orientations. and There's not the eight like you'd be used to with the turning tools. So just pick the corresponding one you want. Select OK. Let's just give it a basic name. And now I can start to build this tool, some size of tool, whatever I want to do. And we've just built the tool. Now, again, to, to what I mentioned, pay attention to this direction. Don't be surprised if the way your machine was commissioned, you may actually have to run it in reverse. Because if you think about the live tool spindle, it is actually pointing from the other direction than the main. So some builders keep this consistent and maybe automatically switch this for you. Some of the builders I've seen, you have to do this. But again, we don't know necessarily if this is a static tool or live tool. So that's up to you as to how you're using it. So if I was actually measuring this tool and I go to my measure tool field, now we would start to see we could update. Now, if the graphic doesn't immediately update depending on the tool configuration you choose, and actually let me go build, grab the tool we were going to do you can refresh the screen. Sometimes I don't always see this up there. So the system is now kind of asking you to just set up two orientations, touch the tool off in a linear distance, and then touch off the tool relative to a diameter. So the default method would be for you to be actually taking the tool to a known diameter, touching the side of it, and the system already knows the diameter tool, so it'll compensate for it. Now, if you happen to be, uh, happen to be in a setup where you want to take an indicator, and sweep the center of the boring holder or the live tool holder while it's at zero center line and set to zero, you can do that, but you do have to make sure that you haven't put in a diameter of the tool in the offset, right? So I can't have a half inch diameter here when I set that that way because it'll automatically compensate for the radius of the tool. So that's the only trick here. Other than that, the setup's going to be quite similar to what you'd be used to. And certainly if we then chose to an axial orientation, so let's say for argument's sake, uh, or from an axial to a peripheral orient orientation. Now we see the system is just showing us how we came in this orientation. So you're going to come down to, again, a known diameter, or you're going to come over and touch the face of the part, and now it's going to compensate again for the radius. Because we want, when at zero, we want the center of the tool, just like as if we were setting up a milling machine. Okay. And as well, as we mentioned, the offset table, you're going to start to see the new fields when you get to the offset fields. So now I can come in and I can adjust the y-axis if I wanted to shift the y or maybe give it some kind of angular adjustment if I needed to in the main spindle. And if you scroll over, you'll get the additional axes. So sometimes from a display panel standpoint, you will have to scroll over a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually now start to go through and methodize a part utilizing some of these features. Because at the end of the day, we certainly want to show you how do I start to program. So I am going to switch back to our slide deck here. And we're going to just give you an example of how we would actually start to apply this technology in a real world example. So this is going to be the part we're about to methodize. So we got a lot of milling and a lot of drilling operations here intentionally. I didn't want to show much turning because we already showed you how to do turning. So we're just going to do a very basic turning op initially. And then we're going to go in. We're going to do what we call a multi-edge cycle. So I'm going to mill this hex on the front of the part. I'm going to mill a slot using our slotting cycle in an axial orientation tool. Then we're going to jump over to a peripheral tool, and we're going to mill a flat on the side of the part. And here we'll use our face milling cycle. We're going to jump in, and we're going to do a rectangular pocket. So here I'm going to come in, and we'll machine a rectangular pocket. And then we're going to do some axial drilling. And then if we were to go back, you'll see there's some peripheral holes on the flat. So some of these features are going to be able to be done 
strictly with the C-axis. Some could be done either way, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through. And then some absolutely have to require a y-axis. So generally, why, when you would need to have a y-axis is when you're doing anything facing the peripheral of the part, so the diameter of the part, and it's going to be off center line. And when it comes off center line, is, is the feature itself obviously going to be flat or does it have some curvature? Because if you don't have a y, the tool is always in the center of the part. So if like for a pocket example from sort of scenario, we are going to do this one pocket that is certainly wrapped around the diameter. So this is a case where I would actually have to use the C-axis and not the Y. But when we look at the flat, the flat's something that can't be done if I don't have a machine equipped with a Y-axis. So you'll see it a little bit more, and there's certainly areas where we can get to choose as we go. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to come on in, and, and we're going to first create a program real quick. We'll do it in our simple part programming area. Once we started the program, we'll give it some name, as we normally do, and then launch into our first header page. So when looking at the header page, we do have a couple new features here. Um, certainly a few things that you wouldn't normally either use or um, maybe options that you just always left off progress to this in lower technology. So the first thing we're going to look at is the describe function. Now, you don't have to use the describe when you get into this kind of technology, but it's more common too. And what describe does when setting it to yes is it allows me to write directly to the work coordinate system, the loaded work coordinate. So in this case, it's G54 in the Z field. So remember how I was saying we kind of know all the offsets, we know where the space of the spindle is, we know the chuck geometry, we know the jaws, we know the projection of the part. Well, it's pretty common then to allow the machine to actually, or the part program, to write the offsets for you instead of you having to go and physically touch those tool offsets or those, uh, shall I say, the, the, the actual work coordinate offset. So that's what this field does. Any, any value inside the ZV field will be written directly to the work offset. Additionally, um, certainly all our standard feeds features stay the same. But you also now get an additional maximum constant surface speed field if you happen to be on a machine equipped with a secondary positionable spindle. So S1 is our main spindle, S2 is the sub-spindle. So from the live tool perspective, the S3 or spindle 3, I don't need a max constant surface speed because it's a milling spindle. So I wouldn't be running constant surface speed. Now, you will see the down cut up cut field that will denote climb milling or conventional milling. Since it knows you can do milling capabilities, we now have an option here in the header. And if the machine has a subspindle, I can also drive my secondary axis for the subspindle in Z to send the subspindle to a park position to get it kind of out of the way. And that's what this field is going to do for us. So if we jump over and we start creating our part program, we can start to apply some of these features. So we jump over to part programs. We're going to do a new program. Give it some name, so I'll call it sample one, let's say, for argument's sake. So you type in a name, it launches. And now we're going to start to see these graphics like we just saw. So here I can certainly select the describe function. And then again, if I plug a number in here, that number will be directly trans transferred to the Z field for G54. I'm going to set up my blank. Now the part we're doing. Just to, just to keep it kind of up there for you a little bit. It's going to be a three inch blank stock. So I'm just going to say the stock diameter is three inches. It's going to stick out from the jaws three. Um, so this way the overall will be projected from three. We're going to do a simple retract of 100 thou off the part. Use a basic tool change position. I'm just using the work coordinate system for now. Um, normally I would use prime machine coordinate system. But here is where I'll set up the max RPM not only for the main spindle, but if I was using the subspindle for the secondary spindle. Safety distance, that's all the same stuff as traditional turning programs. But now I do want to select, do I want to climb mill or conventional mill? And you'll see the graphic itself will even show us if we don't remember which is which. Finally, where do I want to send the subspindle to park it to get it out of the way? So remember I said that if I send this thing to zero, zero, 
two spindle faces would touch. That's why I have 50 inches. It's sending the subspindle 50 inches away. So with chucks and everything else involved, I'd probably end up with 40 inches of space. Now this would obviously be a limitation to the machine depending on how much travel you would have. So we fill out the header like we normally would, and now we're into our editor. So the first thing you're gonna see is that not only do we have our traditional drilling button, turning contour turn, but this button is usually blank. Well, this is what we now have for all of our milling features. So what we did was we really took all of the cycles you're used to in shop mill and bring them right into shop turn so you can now access them. So face milling, pocketing, the multi-edge spigot, which is our, our, our multi-edge or our hex milling, slotting. So we're going to go through and we're going to use a lot of these cycles to kind of machine out this part. So if we look at PowerPoint, our next operation is going to be first just turning the part real fast. So in this case, I don't want to spend a lot of time here. You guys have seen me turn plenty of parts before. We just need to get some simple geometry down. So I'm going to come in. It's going to turn down to an inch and a half diameter. Uh, back, I think it's like an inch and a quarter, out to two and a half and back. So let me go in and we'll just add in some turning features. So as we now move forward, we'll have some areas pre-machined areas where we can put some milling tool path on. So I'm going to use the contour turn. We'll do our, give it a name for our shape. Oops, typo. There's our OD turn. And if I looked at my print, this front diameter here, according to this dimensions, inch and a half. So I'm going to start out at 1.5, start at D0. I'm going to assume this part doesn't need to be faced off. So I'm just going to shoot back my inch and a quarter. We will come out to a diameter of two and a half. So we got a couple of nice diameters here for us to work with and play around with a little bit. Dimensionally, we're going back minus 2.5, and we're going to come out to a final three inch diameter. So this will quickly give us a simple shaped turn. We'll associate this with a stock removal like we traditionally would. So I have I pre-created a 80 degree turning tool and we got some cut parameters in here. And I'm gonna take a pretty aggressive depth per pass just so it speeds up simulation purposes. Okay, so this will be the initial part that we're using for our stock blank so we can start to mill. So we're gonna put some hexes, some flats all around this basic shape of the part. So when we look at the first core operation after just turning the blank, we're going to want to do our multi-edge so I can machine the hex. So we're going to start to come in. Anybody that's ever played with this cycle on a mill, you're going to notice it's probably 95% the same. You know, we've intentionally kept the exact same cycles, and they're actually calling the same cycles that would be called from a mill. So we've only added a few things that makes it unique to this type of technology. So first, you're going to see this little face C field, and we'll talk about it as we start to plug it in the values. Additionally, you're going to have this front or back field, and that's going to control, hey, you might want to send this to my main spindle, or do I want to send it to my back spindle? So from there, everything else is going to be the same. You know, I'm going to set my roughing dimensions and whatnot, and this is what's going to control the orientation. Now, it's certainly important to me that I pick an appropriate tool, so we're going to step through that. Um, and then that'll allow me to start to mill some of these features. So as we look at it, and we start to go in and add some features to it, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to insert right here below the turning cycle, and we're going to put a milling and a multi-edge spigot. Now, if you're used to shop mill, you're used to having drilling, milling, and then contour milling. So that was one of the things to save real estate, because obviously we're running out of buttons here along our vertical soft keys, or shall I say our horizontal soft keys, is what we did was we added under milling, we added a second contour mill button or a button right here to get into the contour milling section. So that's really the only different from a just a navigation standpoint. When you get to this technology, you do have to kind of go into milling to get their contour mill. But all the same cycles are here, including the multi-edge spigot. So multi-edge, I have my three options, rectangular, circular, or multi-sided. So I'm going to pick my multi-sided. I do want to come down and choose 
my tool. But first, just to show you, this is new for 4.7. You do have a field that says complete or simple. So if you have a new operator, you're new to you, you know, the system, and all the parameters are a little intimidating, simple is just the basic version. So what that's saying is this is the bare minimum I would need to be able to create this part program. We're going to keep everything on complete because I want to show you all the features and capabilities of the cycle. Now, from here, I'm just going to grab a tool. Now, I've already pre-created our tools, kind of the way I was showing you in the beginning. So now I'm just going to choose a tool that is set up, in this case, in an axial orientation. Now, this cycle is designed to use tools only in this orientation. So as you see, when I try to switch situate things, I couldn't actually machine this feature with a tool in a peripheral location. I have, to, I have to have it pointing towards the spindle face. So select the tool, give it some speeds and feeds. Now, just like in milling, I could toggle this from feed per minute to feed per tooth. If we toggle to surface footage here for our live tool, it's just going to calculate the RPM. It's not actually constant surface feed, right? Just like on a mill. But now I have some new fields. First question is face or face Y. So you notice I don't have anything that says anything about machining on the diameter because the tool has to be pointed in this direction. But the machine does know that I have a Y axis available. So I could choose face Y and now instead of it rotating the C while it's machining the part, it'll just do X and Y motion around the shape. So as the graphic comes up, so now you see the part stays or the spindle stays fixed and locked and the machine moves around in an X and Y orientation. This is where the travel becomes an issue, right? If I don't have enough travel to get all the way around this part, then certainly I couldn't use the face Y strategy. So a lot of that will just depend on the machine that you buy and how much travel you have. But I do have the option of either or. So I'm going to first do it with a face orientation of C. Now front or back will be used depending on which direction I want to go. So you see how the Zs would want to see it moving the other direction. This could be used for a subspindle. There are actually different ways to apply to a subspindle. Um, so typically you're going to find you're going to just leave this on front either way. Um, it could also be in a scenario where maybe you were going to try to like back turn or back mill a feature. That's another way you could use back. The rest of the field is going to be what we're kind of used to. You know, so um, am I roughing? Am I finishing? And then we just give it some basic geometry. So this was all taken right off the part print. What's my starting diameter? So that's the rough hub. Where does it start from? How many sides do I have? What is the distance across the flats? Now this could be that, or this could be changed to a physical flat distance. So a lot of this stuff you can toggle back and forth. You know, usually when you're, you're learning this stuff, if you see something highlight, try to hit the select key. You know, when you come down on the field and it does the pop-up, if you see the little blue horseshoe, that means there's some options there. Orientation position. Now, initially, when I start to mill some of this stuff, I may not really know where I want it oriented to. Because until I get some other features, there's no point of reference. But this comes in handy because maybe I need to clock the flat in relation to another feature. And then the rest of it's really just going to be corner radiuses, how deep does it go, What's my radial engagement, you know, percentage of cutter or distance, depth per cut? So as we fill it out and we start to simulate it, now you're going to get a chance to see what simulating this type of technology is going to look like on our given control. So here, we'll just turn it real quick. And now the machine's going to start machining it. So you see how it was physically spinning the, and I'll just bring the path on too. See how it's physically spinning the spindle to machine the part? That's because the, that's because we're, we're obviously doing a C-axis, X-axis position. So this would be done whether I have a Y-axis or not. Had we chose the other scenario, then you're going to see the simulation is going to look a little different. So you even get an acknowledgment from simulation if you're using the C-axis or the Y-axis in the feature. So if we come in here, Quick little turn, and now you see we're milling around the part. The part's not sinking with it. So that would be the difference of these two given cycles. So we'll leave it as a C-axis strategy, and now we'll put the next feature on. And the next feature is going to be a slot. So if we look at, 
my PowerPoint here, we have some of the some of the geometry of the slot. So this would be the next feature we'd want to put in. So now in this case, this slot can certainly exist in center line, but it could actually exist off center too. So just because the part's off center, when I'm re referring to the face of the part, I could still do this with a C axis. I wouldn't be limited to having to have a Y axis. Um, really, usually when you run into those problems where you absolutely need a Y axis would be any, any peripheral features. So we're going to come in, we're going to do like a trichoidal milling strategy. So instead of just taking a single tool and sliding it across, we'll do a little, something a little more interesting here. Um, now I will want to go back and do a finishing up because we will get some scalloping. So the, the, the wall finish won't be very good. So we'll come through and do a final finish pass on this part. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to mill this slot feature in using our open slot scenario or strategy. So we transition back to sinew train. And now we're going to go back to milling. And we're going to choose slotting. And then we're going to choose open slot. So there's three slot strategies encapsulated slots, circumferential, and open slots. Now, if you go to some of these, you're now potentially going to get more options. So here, I could do this strategy on the face of the part with C, on the face of the part with Y, but we could also do it on the peripheral of the part with C or on the peripheral for Y. So what you want to do is you want to pay attention when doing a feature to what the shape of the picture looks like. So the minute I'm going to do something on C, the bottom of the pocket slot, whatever it's going to be, can't be flat, right? Because you're rotating the C as you're cutting it, and the center of the tool is fixed on the center of the part. So when you have to machine something that's got a radius to it, you're actually going to want to use the C. Additionally, the walls aren't parallel, right? Because the part's turning. If I need the walls parallel, then I have to have a Y axis. And then the Y axis is going to move around. The part's going to physically stay fixed. So outside of that, the routine is going to look the same. So in this case, I'm going to do a face slot on the front. We're going to do a roughing operation. Um, we are using a 3 s tool that's pointed to my face. I'm going to do some kind of a trichoidal stalling milling strategy, as opposed to maybe plunge, plunge milling. I can then control my tool path, down cut, up cut. So I have all the options here as to how I want this strategy to cut. I can do multiples with a position pattern or a single, and then I just give it some basic dimensions. So where is the center in X and Y? Where is the physical top of the pocket in Z? What's the base dimension? So in this case, if you look at the print, I have a half inch wide pocket, so I'm going to give it the width here. And then I have a length, I just wanted the length to be overall the rough blank size, so I used a half inch. Now, I happen to have a, f a field of 90 in, because I'm orienting the pocket. Now, initially, you're probably not going to know how this is going to relate to the previous element. So let's say we assumed that we were going to leave this at zero. We'll fill out the depth, the percentage, the rest of the, the few options here. And then we went and simulated the feature. So what I want to look at is I want to look at where does the slotting cycle kind of fall in relation to the previous hex. So if I look at the print, I would want the slot parallel to one of the flats. But I notice if I leave them both at zero orientation that I'm actually not parallel with the flat, I'm parallel with the points or perpendicular to the flat. So this is where, you know, you kind of kind of see, and this is where having having the graphics here is, is just such a lifesaver. Now I can see, okay, well, I actually got to clock this feature 90 degrees in either direction. It's not going to make any difference which way I go. It's going to give me the same result to get everything oriented properly. So that's where I can start to use this little A offset. So I type in 90 degrees, accept it. Um, I might as well go back and add in my finish cycle. So we'll just do a quick little finish. We'll do a finish on the wall, accept it. So now we should have a finished slot. The slot should be oriented properly and cleaned up, and we won't get those scallop tools, tool path that you saw um, from the from the wall, left on the wall. So we have our milled feature. We come through. So here you see this is orienting and running the spindle around because I'm doing a XC feature. 
Now, what if this was offset? I could still do it with the C. I don't require a Y for that scenario. So like just to show you for argument's sake, what if I had offset this thing three-eighths of an inch? And I'll do it in the finish cut too so it doesn't overcut. So the same feature can work in this orientation. So usually the rule of thumb as to whether or not you're going to need a y-axis if you're looking at a part that you're methodizing is once I get to peripheral operations, that's where I have to be very careful. So here you can see it's totally off-center, but still I can do it with the c-axis feature. Okay, so we are going to just put this thing back to zero so it looks like our nice little part here, and we're going to keep moving on. Great. There we are. And then we're just going to keep building event by event like we typically would in any standard shop turn program. So now I want to do some peripheral work. So I have a flat on the part, so I need to handle that flat. So I could have machined the flat a couple different ways. I could use a pocketing cycle, start from the center, and work my way out. But in a case like this, why would I want to plunge into the middle of the part when I could ramp on from the outside? But whenever you get to this scenario, like I said before, now that this feature is perfectly flat, the only way I can do that is with the y-axis. So we're going to have to use the selection for the y-axis, and then we fill out the rest of the basic cycle. So in looking at it, we're still going to use the milling and the face mill routine. Now I want to make sure that I'm choosing a tool that's now pointed towards my OD. It's a peripheral orientated tool, right? So I built it previous. Feeds and speed definition, that's all the same. So when I look at it, this scenario always has to have a y-axis. So whether it's in the the OD or the face, just because of the nature of the tool path. So where, yes, I could face off a part by spinning the spindle, this, this feature is always going to want to do X, Y tool path, so you can only ever use the facing cycle if you have a Y axis. Now we're going to give it some basic geometry. So I happen to know, let me bring up the print here real quick, at the start of it is going to be inch and a quarter back, right? All right, oh, no, this is Y. Y is actually going to be half the width. So my width, in this case, is a total of inch and a half for my flat. So I can come in and I can tell it that one edge of it in Y. So if you look at the, the part, so this is Z, right? Back and forth along the edge of the part. X is in, is in and out, but perpendicular to this surface. So this feature right here, the width of the flat, would actually be denoted as Y. So I'm going to give it a minus 0.750. Starting position, I said, was inch and a quarter in Z. Now, some of the cycles will refer radially as opposed to diametrically, and this is one of those that happens. So my starting diameter, I want to be up here. Well, if I know the stock is 2.5, I can't type 2.5 here because it's actually going to move radially off that. So I have to use half of that value. So if I do 2.5 divided by 2, that would be the linear distance out. So the system is not in diametric mode at this point with this cycle. Give it a width of my part, and y is inch and a half. Depth is going to be an absolute, and we'll say it's back, minus 2.5. And this would be my ending position. So if you look at this dimension, from the center of the feature at the flat dimension, is one inch radially, so that's what I'm going to put. Usually there's a designation on the field if it's required to be diametric, but if you're not sure, usually I would always, in a, in a lathe variant, actually guess as a diametric value. And then if obviously if it's shifted way up the part, I realize pretty quickly that that value should have been a radial value. So we fill it out. We go to simulate, and now we should be getting the flat on our part. So we're going around, milling our feature, and we're going to get a flat up here. If we did everything correctly, let me maybe orient this a little bit more for us. And there is our flat. And certainly, I'd probably take multiple depth of cuts, but for, for speed's sake, we'll just clean it up. And if I look at my part, I see the flat 
it's parallel to my features, so so far I'm oriented properly. Okay, so that would be the flat. Now, in this example, had I needed to orient that flat somewhere else, that's where I would use this C0 field. So this is clocking my C in relation to this feature. So that's how I would move it around. So any value I put in here, it would now shift it around the part. Okay, so we're getting, doing good. We're almost at the point at which our milling's done. So if I look at the second print, we just have this pocket to do. So now when you get to pockets that are wrapped around a cylinder, programming from the y-axis perspective is a little different. So what happens here is when I get to, first of all, um, positioning it, I do have, I have two scenarios that I have to think about. So from the rectangular pocket standpoint, anything that relates to the y-axis when I'm in a peripheral orientation, it is wrapped around the diameter. So not only when I'm going to do something like calculate the width of my pocket, right? But additionally, if I wanted to figure out where the center of the pocket is in relation to y, I would actually have to calculate out the arc length. So I actually gave you the formula here to do it as how it works. So arc length is the diameter, the major diameter that I'm on. So let's say two and a half inch diameter I would be on this part. It's going to be then times pi, so 3.1415, times the included angle divided by 360. So if I wanted to figure out what the arc length is halfway around a part, I would actually divide 180 by 360 to get 0.5, and then take 2.5 times pi times 0.5, and that would give me the arc distance around. So that's what I would have to put in for the y center point if I wanted the position 180 degrees out from the flat. But we do also have an extra feature that I'm going to show you in the transformation scenario that allows me to clock my C. But this isn't, a lot of people think this is just moving the C, but this is really spinning the, the work coordinate system or the unit coordinate system around Z 180 degrees. So if you position it there, you got to remember to position it back, or now you just really shifted your zero is what it's doing. It would be the same as if I went to the C offset in G54 and put 180 degrees there is what this feature is actually doing. So let's show you kind of how it works a little bit to kind of get your head around it. Because I know this one sounds a little bit, a little bit further out there per se. So let's say for argument's sake, I went in and we just put the pocket in and we didn't really pay attention to where it was going to kind of fall on the part. So we can go over to pocket. I'm going to pick a rectangular pocket. We want to pick an OD peripheral tool. I'm using a quarter inch tool. Give her some feeds and speeds as always. And now, I have a bunch of different locations I can put that pocket in. But we want to do it in the peripheral of C. And we have to do it in the peripheral of C because if we look at our print, this pocket is wrapped around the diameter with a 60 degree included angle between it. It's either outside or inside. So depending on where the pocket is, if I can reach inside of a part. I think it's standard. What am I going to do? Rough it, finish it. How are we cutting this tool path? So from here, we're going to tell it the location of the pocket. So this is that field that I was telling you that is where I could trigger the pocket. So let's say I assumed it was at zero. We started filling out the rest of the location of the pocket, so where it is in Z, where is the outside position, and then I start to give it the dimensions. Now, the 3.308, that was what I calculated using that formula I just gave you. So the diameter times pi times the included angle, in this case 60 divided by 360. If you do that math, that's going to calculate the arc length of 1.308. So that's how I define the width of the pocket. Length is Z, so that's a direct relation to my print. Corner radius is, and then I'm giving it the rest of the dimensions. Do I need to clock it? Now you start to see how we can move things around in space. So let's say we did this very thing, and we simulated the part. Okay, so my hope is that the pocket's going to end out 180 degrees from the flat. The reality of what you're about to see is it's actually going to try to machine the pocket on the flat. 
because at no point did I tell it where this pocket was in relation to zero. I said it was at zero. So there's your y zero. So it's right on top. So I have two ways to start moving this thing around. I could move the y axis. And again, with this feature, I'm wrapping around a cylinder. So I'd have to do the math to calculate. So let's say I assumed a value of, I don't know, 2.5 inches just to throw something in here you're going to start to see that the pocket starts to shift. Now, I'm going to jump up the speed of simulation real quick just to get it done pretty fast. All right. There you go. So now you start to see the pocket is moving. Now, of course, I didn't calculate out the position, so it didn't come perfectly out over here. So I could do the formula. I can get it right on that side. Or the other feature we have is, and let me get to it right here. Uh, give me one second. My, my computer is getting a little slow here for a second. Uh, well, what we're going to do here once she decides to come back for me is we're going to go into various, and various is where we're going to find that physical position. All right, come on. To come back in one second. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. So I want to get rid of my Y field. So zero this out. And now what I can use to clock things around, and I can do them in an angular position, is I can insert between these two features a various and a transformation and a rotation about C of the work coordinate system. So what I'd want to do is I'd want to do a new one. So there's two fields, new or additive. Additive would be like incremental, so I could build them off the last one. But a new one would base off of the work coordinate that's active. And I'm just telling it, hey, spin the work coordinate system 180 degrees around C. That will now let this pocket occur still with a position Y of zero at this other location. But because I changed the work coordinate system 180 out, I do have to remember to switch it back. So when I'm done, switch it back to zero, or then when I do other features, they're not going to line up. So a final simulation of the part here, and I should see now that the pocket is actually going to be 180 degrees out. So there you see the milled pocket, and we are now currently 180 degrees out of the flat. And we have successfully done all of our milling. So we got a little bit more to do. We got some simple drilling to do, but we want to show you how I can drill on the face of my part off center line with live tools as opposed to when we come back to the, the next picture, we're going to do some offset drilling and then we'll start to wrap up this part. So we're, we're certainly moving right along here. Okay. So the next operation set, we'll start to get into drilling after we talk about clocking the zero back. I showed you that. So now we're going to start to drill. So when we come to drilling, the minute I have live tooling, you can see you're going to get a whole new series of, of drilling cycles. Where traditionally on a, a standard lathe, they only have one, and it's called centric drilling, because that would be used for a static drill that only drills in the middle of the part. Now you get all the drills that you would get in a uh, standard milling machine. So we can do center drilling, we can do deep hole drilling, and then we can associate it to some type of routine. In this case, I'm going to use a bolt hole pattern to do it. Now, in our part, it's kind of interesting. Because I have a pocket and a flat, we only have four holes, but it is still a bolt hole pattern. So there's a couple of different ways I could do it. I could done a partial bolt hole twice, or what I'm going to show you how to do is do a full bolt hole pattern, but I can tell it to then skip over some of the holes. So that's what we're going to use right now to get this feature in. Um, then after that, we're going to go back and we're going to put the flats in. So first things first, let's get in our diameter holes. All right. So looking at our part, we got a 266 hole to do. Uh, we also had a called out countersink of 325 for 90 degrees. So we'll do a center drill, a spot drill, and then we'll drill. So when I come to drilling, there's your centric. So this would be for 
only drilling that happens dead center of the part, and this would be typically used for a static tool. But now I get all my other drilling cycles. So in this case, I'm going to come in, I'm going to fill out this page. So let's go pick a tool. Now I do need to get a center drill that can spot fill a spot face a 325 countersink. So I'm going to grab that one. And some speeds and feeds. I'm certainly not worried about speeds and feeds. Now I want to tell it how it's oriented. And certainly if I'm going to be using the C or the Y to get to those positions. Tell it how do I want to control the depth. This is normal for anybody that's done any drilling on a milling machine with our control. Now I'm going to immediately jump in and we'll give it our drill ream. And we have a 266 drill, an H drill pre-created for us. Some speeds and feeds. How is it oriented? How am I controlling the depth? Um, in this case, total depth is 5 eighths. So we can just put 625. We have some new cycles here. Um, this would be specific to 4.7. Uh, we're not going to go into them in depth right now. But you can do spot drilling with the tools, a bunch of new features here. Um, I covered it in a previous webinar, and we'll probably look at these things more in the, in the coming months as well, because there's a lot of new drilling routines in the latest version of 4.7. But for time's sake, we're just going to drill a couple holes. Now I'm going to go in and give it my bolt hole pattern. So if I want to do it all in one bolt hole pattern, I can use a complete bolt hole pattern. I'm going to tell it where the bolt hole pattern exists, right? So like we've been seeing in these different routines, and do I want to use the Y or the C? I can tell it if it's centric, if it's centered around center line, or if it's eccentric. So I'm not even limited to just working around the center line of the part. And then I just got to give it where the front feature of the face is, which in this case is negative inch and a quarter back. Where's my first hole? Right, and then how many holes do I want to do? Now we get this feature called hide position. And hide position allows me to then go back and say, okay, which of the holes did I not want to drill? So I can now turn these on or off, and you'll see it's probably hard for telling you to sell on the display. But if the hole is active, it gets a little X through it. If I unclick it, it's a circle. So I could pick a few and just get a circle instead of an X. So if I was going to guess, maybe I'd want to exclude 0 and 180. It could really be 90 and 270. I'm not 100% sure until I simulate it. So let's just make an educated guess here. So if you look at your graphic view, again, it's showing you that these two are circles because it's not going to do those. It's going to skip over them. So we save it. We simulate. And let's go check to see what this feature looks like. Oh, we're going to rotate her back a little bit. Maybe I'll speed up to save some time. All right. So in this case, looks like I guessed properly. So I didn't get a hole here that certainly would have broken into that pocket. We got our nice little countersink, and I didn't get a hole up here. But I could have as easily gone back to that feature, checked the opposing two boxes, and just skipped over those holes. So it's a nice little feature within the bolt hole pattern that a lot of people don't realize exists is the ability of jumping over holes like that. OK, so we've drilled on our face. Now looking back, the next operation would be to drill on the peripheral. Now in this scenario, this can only be done with a y-axis because I'm off center of the of center line, right? And if you look at the drill, position is coming straight into the bar, just perpendicular to flat. It would be impossible to do that with a CX without some kind of crazy elaborate tooling. So in this case, we will be using the y-axis feature to drill these couple holes. So in our case, um, the print actually calls out to center drill, drill, and tap. So we might as well throw a couple operations in, and then we we'll give it these coordinates. And then we will be just about done with this part. OK, so we're going to go back over to drilling. Now, again, the cycles themselves don't differentiate where they are. So one cycle can handle all these different strategies. So now that I'm you know, coming in, maybe I'm going to grab that center drill. 
and I happen to know, okay, now in this case, it's working from the y-axis, not the face. We can give it a spot drill diameter. Um, I think my print calls that out in the previous page. Yep, so we got uh, 200 thou. So we can type in 200 thou here. And now we can work through. So it just it makes all the cycles that much more versatile, being able to kind of flip them around and orient them and hit them in any orientation plane. So let's say we're going to do that. We're going to drill a few holes real quick. So now I'm going to go down and grab my tap drill for a 1032, a number 21 drill, some feeds and speeds. Where is it located? All right. How am I controlling the depth? Uh, I've called out the depth to be 494. Now you see here, I'm actually programming the depth incremental instead of absolute. This gets easier in this type of technology because later I'm going to establish the plane that I'm drilling from, like I did with the, pat, the last one, right? The Z minus 1.250, that's in the position screen. So it's sometimes it's easier to say, hey, what's, how deep am I going from wherever I'm drilling from? I'm going to be setting up where I'm drilling from in the position location. So usually I'm a big advocate of doing everything in absolute until you get to scenarios like this. And this is a case where I certainly would want to maybe leverage incremental positioning. It actually makes things a lot easier. Okay, we'll do our final tapping. So I had pre-created a tap for us here and build like any tap would be on a mill. Fill out the basic information about the tap. Again, where is it oriented, a pec, that kind of stuff. Certainly the depth of my tap. But now the big ticket here is where am I physically drilling? So we're gonna to go to positions. In this case, I'm gonna just do a couple random holes. And now it's important for me to set up where it's located. So they could be peripheral around the diameter of the part. They could be on a flat. They could be on the face of the part, or they're gonna be on the face using the y-axis. So again, just like you've been seeing, you just kind of get, you get familiarized with all these different variants. Now, I did incremental because here I'm denoting this top surface, and that top surface in this scenario is a radial distance. We could clock the feature here with the positions, just like we saw, showed you in that singular event, right? Or I can leave it at zero. So again, I may not know if you don't, just leave it at zero, and then we'll run one and see if we got it in the right location. Then you're just going to give it your locations. So in this case, the offset, if you think about this view, is the y-axis. So that's z. So from here, I give it my coordinates. We accept it. And now, if we did everything right, we should have this feature drilled out. All right, so we'll turn, mill, get our slot in. Looks good so far. Machine our flat. Now, one of the things I like to do as things get a little busy sometimes is I'll just hit the delete path. That way my show path stays on, but it just cleans up some of the other stuff here. So it's just going to delete whatever happened prior to me hitting that button. But now we see we have our drilled holes. Maybe if I want to go in, I can go into a sectional view and cut it out. And you can kind of see, let me go back in Z. Kind of see our depth a little bit here. So there we got the depth of our hole. I would buy that. I think I said 494 or something. It certainly looked right. Okay, so there's one feature we're going to put left on the part just to kind of show you how the cycles um, can certainly start to give you some, some more advanced feature functionality. And what we're going to do is we're just going to put a simple little chamfer, put a chamfer wrapped around this pocket. So with that being said, let's jump back. So how am I going to do it? Well, we're going to do it with the pocket cycle. So when we look at the pocket cycle, one of the options we have is to perform a chamfer. But now with this peripheral surface, just like the, the regular milling cycle, it's going to use the C-axis and wrap it around this feature. Now this would be the same scenario if I used engraving. So you can start to do engraving on peripherals and you don't even need a Y-axis. You can just use the C-axis and the engraving feature. You can just flip through these options. 
So for us, we're just going to jump back to Sinew Train and place our final operation, which happens to be a milling and a pocket. And we're going to pick our, so I'm just going to use my center drill as my chamfering tool. So you can use center drills as long as they're spot drills as chamfering tools, um, but it's certainly going to assume that it's a, a point. So the size, if there was any flat, it wouldn't compensate for that flat, but it makes a nice quick chamfering tool. Um, I do have to, when using a center drill, keep this in inches or feet per minute, because feet per tooth, I don't have any flute definition in the center drill, so it's going to give me an alarm. Okay, so where is it located? So it's still in the peripheral. What am I doing? I'm chamfering. When you go to the chamfer, you get a couple of new fields, and that would be chamfer size. So we're doing a 30 pound chamfer. And then insertion depth. So how deep do you want to go? So again, this tool thinks it's dead sharp. If you had a flat, then you'd want to build it as a tapered end mill because then it can compensate for the flat and give you the correct chamfer size. So we finally accept this, save it, and now we can simulate. All right, so I'll speed up a little bit just to catch up. So now we're milling the pocket in. There's our drilling. Let's uh, clean up our tool path a little bit. All right, and then she's going to roll around here. Oh, and I forgot to clock it, right? So that is where I need that C rotation, the beauty of simulation. So we just come on back. We're going to need these two positions. So certainly I could copy and paste it if I wanted to. And that would clock my C. And then I certainly, whenever I'm writing to an offset like that, would want to cancel it when I'm done. So now if we get one final simulation, we should be there. All right. So we turn it. There's our mill. There's our slotting cycle, our finish. We put our flat on it, put our pocket in it. Let's do our basic drilling. There's our center, then our drill. Let's center on the outside. Okay, tap. And now we see our chamfer. So if we were to zoom into her, see we get a nice little corner break right along the feature. Okay, so we got a successful part. It certainly looks like our part print. Good. So now what I wanted to do, just as we uh, kind of wrap, wrap up before we start opening up for some questions, is I, I wanted to give you a pre-done example, certainly not writing from scratch, but to show you kind of then where you can kind of take this type of functionality built into a control. Um, so what I did here was I pre-created something a little more elaborate, and we're going to mill this feature out. And not only that, but we're going to give you a, a little taste of what working with a subspindle starts to look like. So not only are we going to mill this feature, but we're going to then part it off, grab it with subspindle, part it off, move it back, and then do an irregular pocket. So the cycles, for those of us that, that have programmed in the milling controls for Siemens, all those are regular contour cycles, well, they exist there for me as well. Um, and I can and can use those. And then I can use them um, just with a simple, you know, C-axis uh, lathe, so really two axis lathe with a positional spindle, or I could use them with the Y-axis as well. So same scenario applies. So I have this part pre-methodized for us. So if we jump on back and look at our program, so this one's kind of interesting. I used that DXF converter I was talking about. So if I bring a DXF in the machine, I get a couple things I can do with it now in 4.7. Um, whether I have the option or not, I can always open it up and view it. So if you want to bring prints in, you can bring prints over into the machine and then have them here. This one was never written with any dimension lines. That's why you don't see it. Now, I use this to actually create the toolpath for this part just saved me a lot of time. So in this case, I built a part program. 
Now, how did I do it? Well, initially, I have a, a basic blank of, of five and a half inches, right? Now you're going to see the rest of the page looks identical to what we did before. So where do I want to position when I'm done? Where am I shifting it? You know, that kind of stuff, right? And then I used initially a simple turning cycle just to come down and machine out that hub. So if I was going to just show you step by step a little bit, we came in and we just want to machine out the boss so we can go down and start doing some milling on it. So the turning tool is going to roll in and just machine out this feature. Now, on the part, we had a hole in here. But I didn't want to drill a hole. I wanted to mill it. So I wanted to kind of play around a little bit here. So with that, I then used a circular pocket cycle, put a circle pocket in the face. And that would actually allow me to come in and do kind of a face milling orientation. So I'm using the C and the Z, and then positioning on the X, to open this bore up. So from that perspective, I can actually, a lot of times I like to do this when I'm staging a shop turn program, is I'll just throw an end of program in real quick. It keeps me from running the entire job to length. So now we're going to get not only the turn feature down, but we'll see a pocket, but a pocket used at center line with a tool that's slightly smaller, and the bore that I'm looking to. And it's really giving me like a helical toolpath is really what I'm getting. But helical, where it's in place of the Y motion, it's giving you C motion. So how do I handle that complicated shape? Well, what I did was I went to milling, I went to contour milling, and then I used one of the three strategies we here. We have path milling, and that would be walking around the wall of a part, either OD or ID. We have a regular pocket milling, which is what I did on the back side. And we also have spigot milling or boss milling. So in the spigots, I have to physically draw some kind of stock boundary. But then by having access to the DXF, I was actually able to open the DXF file, just pick the entities, and it automatically built the path. So that next webinar or the webinar that's coming up in a few when I do the 47 DXF, we're going to go talking about how to do this in detail, um, and we'll do a few different examples there of it. But this just certainly allows me to get all these points in pretty quick and easy. But in a scenario like this, I don't even need a, a y-axis for this. And certainly it looks complicated, but since everything could be touched while keeping this tool on center line, I was able to mill out all this feature just with using the face C strategy. But the rest of the strategies like you've been seeing still are here. So you can manipulate them depending on the, the part. So what are we going to get when we start to do these kind of operations? Well, if we simulate it, and I also used a little center drill again to put a small chamfer around the part. But if we simulate it, we're now going to see that we're going to get this machined shape. So we'll turn her down. So the shape's going to end up right here on that back wall. So we bring out our bore. Now we're going around and we're actually milling out this feature. So we can quickly start to get to some you know, pretty complex shapes here. I'll delete the toolpath. Conversationally, using really all the can cycles that you guys are already familiar with and just kind of getting your head around some of these variations. Now, in this part, I kind of went to the next step. So now what we're going to do after my program stop is we're going to bring over the subspindle. She's going to do a part off. So here the subspindle comes up, parts it off, transfers it back, and then we're going to do it in a regular pocket. So just to cheat, I used the exact same shape, just left a heavy wall that I didn't finish on the side as an offset. And I was able to quickly come in and core out the back side of this part. When we get to the webinar where we start talking about the subspindle machine, uh, we're going to teach you how to do those transfers. But not only just the transfers, we're going to get into all the different variants. You know, do you want to simply pick in place? Do you want to pick and part off? Do you want to pull it out of the out of the main spindle then part off? Because you know you're throwing a piece of the part. So we will get a chance to start to go into some more of this advanced technology as we move forward. 
Okay, so hopefully you guys found that, uh, that educational and interesting. Starts to at least show you some of the capabilities. Um, with that being said, we're certainly going to open up to any questions that may have arose, whether it be on this topic um, or any topics for that matter. So feel free to uh, start to uh, plug in some questions into the chat window or the Q&A window, either one, and I'll keep an eye on both of them here. So with that being said, let's take a look here and see if we have any questions. Okay, so I have a couple questions started to come in. I'm just uh, scrolling through because sometimes they get buried a little bit. All right, so um, what if I don't have a y-axis and I want to machine a face or uh, and or a circumference on my, my part? So I, I think uh, probably that was maybe put in um, prior to some of the, the last examples, um, but certainly, um, you know, with that condition applying, as long as the tool can stay staged on center line, you can do any of these milled features um, on on center line as you just saw. Uh, and hopefully that answers that question. Um, when, when would you want to use the Z Z V field in the header oh, to describe the offset? Okay, so. On a simple, simpler lathe like this, you know, a Z field, what the person is referring to is if you open up that header, we we're talking about this describe field, this Z, Z, ZV field. You know, it's kind of, on a basic lathe like this, it's kind of six one half dozen the other. You know, if you if you got a scenario where you want the system to um, automatically fill out, figure out its handoffs and its pickoffs, then you start to use this describe, and the system will actually calculate the work offsets properly um, that, that are going to get fed into the system. Um, there's a lot of setup that comes along with using the Z, ZV field. Um, specifically, we have to know what the chuck dimensions are. I don't tend to use this in a simple single spindle machine, but when we get to more complex double spindles, kind of like the sub, side, sub spindle side of this, um, then it gets helpful. So if you go to your offset screen and you go to your setting data, in here we can start to tell the system what the chuck geometries are, the chuck width, the projection of the draw height. So now if I start to know where they are, where my stock's going to stick out, the system can figure out where it needs to send the subspindle go pick up off the, off the other part automatically just by me giving it some basic dimensions, and that's where utilizing the ZV field starts to come into play. It also keeps any operator from inadvertently overwriting the value because it's going to write the value for itself right into the work offset. Okay. Um, I have another question here. Could you also use the swivel cycle to do the C axis rotation? Um, you could. Um, I think the problem more, and, and what, what the uh, this person's referring to, is we have a feature in the control called swivel cycle. Um, it's also referred to as cycle 800. And you see it more in five axis machines or in higher technology like lathes with a B axis as well as a Y. So a lathe that could do five axis. You would get a swivel button here. Um, the problem is in this lower, lower technology, not that this is a low technology machine by any means, uh, but you don't typically see the swivel cycle commissioned in a machine like this. So without having the swivel cycle, I would have to use that C clocking to orient the part. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, I have a question here. If the presentations are available in PDF. So I don't physically post the PowerPoint PDFs anywhere, um, but I'm happy to share them. So if you want to just send me an email uh, requesting the PDF, I'll absolutely happily send it back to you. And that holds true with any of these ones you see. So if you saw an older one and you'd like to, to get the slide deck from it, just let me know. I can send it out. Uh, again, just to give it to you guys that might have missed it, here's the email address. So chris.pollock at siemens.com. So just shoot me a quick email. I'd be happy to um, provide you guys with the PDFs from these. And I think I got everybody, but I may not have because there's uh, 
Oh, I got a question here. When will the webinar be available? So the recording usually publishes within an hour or so, so I always try to get out the thank you email right after that. Um, so at that point, you guys can access it, download it, or stream it live. Um, as far as it being on our CNC for you, eh, maybe about a week or so. It usually takes a little bit of a lag before I get the links up there because that's where our IT guys have to get involved and our, our web manager people have to get involved in posting that. Um, but you'll have the recording, I would say, um, before end of day today, hopefully, as long as WebEx has it uh, published. Okay. Well, if I miss, because there's a lot of little chatting going on here, too. So if I missed anybody's question, feel free to email me um, or give me a ring or however you like to. And I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy day. I know it's, it's always hard to find time to join me for another one of these webinars. Hopefully you guys found it uh, educational and helpful, and I look forward to seeing you guys for the next one. All right, you guys have a great weekend. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.